united with Christ. Meet local churches with open doors serving throughout the Border Valley community and sharing the truth and hope of God's love and salvation. A presentation by KSCE Channel 38 Christian Television. And now, United with Christ. Well, good morning and welcome to Life Christian TV. I'm Alan Stoddard, a pastor up at Calvary Ruidoso in New Mexico, two hours north from the beautiful city of El Paso. And I have my brother here, Chris Navarro, who we have had on the program United with Christ before. And we are talking about spiritual awakening, revival in local churches, encouraging people to follow Christ, to give their lives to Christ, and to encourage people to be ready for a harvest when God sends it. A couple of uh, a couple of things. I want to read a scripture and pray with you. And also, uh, if you have a prayer need or any questions, you will see the number on the screen there. We would love for you to call in, and we'd love to pray for you. I took a prayer request last week, and remembered to pray for this sweet lady who called the station last week. It was beautiful. A couple of scriptures that will kind of help us as we. Uh, think about uh, reaching people for Christ, helping them in their walk with God, and how to disciple people. Um, Matthew 28, uh, verse 18, Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you and remember, that's a command, and remember, I am with you always to the end of <coughs> the age. And then in Acts chapter 1, um, you probably have it memorized, but in the 8th verse, our Lord and Savior said this. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in three places, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Yeah, and that yeah. is what we want to talk about, our <clears throat> role in that grand narrative. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your hand on our lives. Yes, thank you for the privilege to call you Savior and Lord. We pray in Jesus' name for your anointing, your Holy Spirit's filling in these days, in this hour, and Lord, through our program, encourage pastors, leaders, church uh, members, disciples of Jesus. We come to you wanting to learn. Lord, teach us now in Jesus' name, bring revival to the southwest of New Mexico and Texas and Colorado and, and Arizona and Southern California and Northern Mexico and pour out your spirit that an awakening might take place in this nation that will rock us and we'll see thousands, if not millions, come to faith in Christ in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. So we're going to jump in for about 22 minutes here and talk about the Great Commission. Of course, we've been resurfacing that theme um, as a matter of of focus because we know most churches are 70% of churches in the United States they're plateaued meaning they're just they're on a line they're not growing and they may be partially uh, decreasing and and it's hard because once you lose momentum in a church it's hard to seize it now sometimes you can cover it up the larger the church you can kind of cover it up with stuff uh, attendance but underneath attendance numbers are the real numbers so we've enjoyed some success in, in um, Ruidoso with numbers, but those are just really shallow at some point. They're important. They reveal momentum. They're people. But the question becomes, what do we do with people? People who don't know Christ, and then people who know Christ, and then we got to jump in and help do what Matthew 28 says. I will remind us. The main verb here is not go, it's not baptizing, it's not teaching, it's not remembering. The main verb is making disciples. So we are to go because all authority has been given to Christ. He deputized the 12 and us 
to go, therefore, and do what? So as we're going would be a good Greek translation. As you're going, as you're living your everyday life. By the way, I, I meant to say this in the program last time, last week. So like I brought Chris and Tim and, and I brought these brothers on because Alan Stoddard, Chris Navarro, and our brother Tim Ebert who was on, we're nobodies. We are Joe Schmoes. No one's going to remember our names in about 70 years unless we leave somebody a lot of money. <laughs> and you know what I mean? And so what, what difference does our life make, our lives make? Well, it makes a difference because Christ has come in. We have the mission of God in our, in our windshield, and we're looking for how we can jump in. So we're to go and make disciples and then baptizing and teaching. I want to focus in on the baptizing and the teaching today and, and talk some more about disciple making. And so I know that, and, and really we'll call, we'll call it what John Burton would call it, follow up. What do we do with people after they come to know Christ? The grunt work of that is following up on these people and getting them to a place of spiritual maturity. We were talking about this some on the way down um, I've known Chris for a few years now. We've done grunt work in evangelism and disciple making. In churches, one of the rough things is to see someone come to know Christ. They come to the church. They make a profession of faith in Christ. They get saved. And I think they're genuinely saved. Now, maybe some aren't. God's God. Alan's not God. But, but they get saved and they get baptized. But then there might be a moment and period of good growth and fruit. But then there's this falling off of some people. How do we, Chris, how do we follow up on people in a way that helps them stick to the local church? Well, we got to scoop them up. And I, I like the word you use. We have to be intentional. We've got to be intentional about it. Take them under our wing and feed to them what's been fed to us. It's, it's the whole reason that we're here some 2,000 years down the road. Because how, that's what how can we be intentional? We say three things. Discipleship needs to be, disciple making and follow up needs to be intentional, relational, relational and reproducible. Okay, so what does intentional look like? What are some real things that our viewers, right now we say you're in a local church, here's how you can get intentional in following up on newer or younger believers. Well, I think specifically with the teachings that we use, you mentioned John Burton, that uh, the teaching of the um, three circles of discipleship that comes from the 60s from Bill Bright and Campus Crusade. Um, I like that. I was telling someone else about it yesterday, uh, Pedro, a young man, uh, and Kelly, who I, I walked down that street I never walked down, and she said she turned down that street she never turns down, and, and she got that three circles of discipleship in about, that's the quickest teaching I've ever been able to uh, give it in that period of time, because she was expressing that she wanted to come back to God. She's a believer, and we were talking about this outside. Evangelism is just not for the unsaved, but those that have fallen away. And in that teaching, um, I was able to explain it to her, but this is, this is how we come back to God. So uh, I think that's a good, I think you're going to talk more about that. The, the, so I'll, I'll leave well, that Well, there's, there's some verses in James. I believe it's chapter 5. Mm -hmm. And I'm winging it. Too, yes, uh, at the end, story. he says, my, uh, James 5, 19, My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you strays from the truth and someone turns him back, let that, let that person know that whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. There's something about the grunt work, of, is what I call it, the grunt work of the Great Commission, which is this, Velcroing yourself intentionally to people. Okay, so like I said, we were going to mention his name, so let's not forget and let's mention his name. Scott Sheltman. <laughs> Tell the story of Scott Sheltman. Well, it was that uh, three years ago in March, we were doing the 30 days of prayer in Little Houses and then the Wednesday at church, which we're still doing three years later for revival. <laughs> and uh, I left uh, a prayer meeting, and I was driving, and he was sitting in an all subs, and I heard that voice again, turn around. So I got to talk to Scott, and uh, he was um, a street person on his way back to Pittsburgh, and um, we just shared the faith with him. He, he, he was a believer, just uh, 
I remember he had been him. saved in jail. I right. don't know if you remember that. Right. Okay, you remember. He got saved in jail. It was on that Easter weekend that we baptized yeah. Scott. And we also did some intentional follow-up with him. Right. We put him in a hotel. I remember leaving the prayer meeting. We went to that prayer and meeting. And we were studying James and that morning. And we were morning. studying James. Thursday. <laughs> and, and, and the Lord was like, okay, this guy, this is a homeless guy in a prayer meeting. Okay, now, first of all, that doesn't happen, okay? That, that was the funny thing, that, Pastor. I was getting ready to leave, and uh, he says, well, can you give me a ride? And I said, well, I'm, I'm going to this prayer meeting. He said, well, I want to go there. Can you give me a ride? <laughs> so, okay, let's go. Okay, when you're leaving, I remember feeling the weight of, okay, you're not going to say to this guy, well, be warm and filled when it's within your power to do good. Yeah. And so I called you, said, hey, what are you doing? Well, I'm, you were, I knew out. you were gonna trying figure to figure it out. out. And I said, let's meet over at the hotel. We're putting this guy up for a few days. Yeah. Long story short, viewers, we, we followed up on this guy. And to the extent that about a, a month or so later, he went back to Pittsburgh. Yeah, and I right. remember telling a pastor at a pastor's conference in Costa Mesa, California, that I said, hey, you're from South Pittsburgh. Could you reach out to a guy? Yeah. And they did. And they got him to church. I still have the picture. And still, Scott, every once in a while, will try to reach out. Now, I tried to reach out to him, and uh, I think he didn't have enough minutes on his phone. Yeah. My point, though, is this, not all these details. It's intentionally hanging in there long enough for the opportunity to intentionally relate to a person, which is messy. And then intentional could also be a part of the teaching. We want to intentionally relate, but we also want to intentionally get somebody to reproduce. And so to do that, the Great Commission says teaching them to observe. That means that we teach them what Jesus, we teach them the Word of God to actually live the Word of God. And that has to happen intentionally. And it, and it gets frustrating. I mean, you're a street evangelist, not just a street evangelist, but you're a street evangelist, a evangelizer. And, and so I don't have to tell you how frustrating it be because people sometimes their life skills don't match their life change yet. And that can make you go, is this worth it? Right. Uh, in churches, we have people who come and their life change is not fast enough. According to some predetermined measurement, we all have. And we want to be careful. What they need in the Great Commission is the teaching them to observe. Now, how did Jesus do it? He called out 12, spent three years with them, put up with them. And even in the end, when they got... Before he went to the cross, Peter denied, Judas betrayed, they all fled, except for John, but they all fled, and they were in disarray. Now, what did Jesus do? He cooked them breakfast in John 21. He said, hey, and tell Peter. Pe and call for Peter, too. <laughs> hey, P yeah, call for Peter, too, Mark 16, 5. Hey, Peter, uh, you can come back. Do you love me? Yes. Do you love me? He gets frustrated. Third time, do you love me? He's frustrated. And he says, you know all things. And yeah. Peter was restored to ministry. And in many local churches, what we do is we have a lack of intentionality. And so because we're not intentional, we think, oh, we just want to run our attendance numbers up. Right. And so we get frustrated. Okay, so do you think in an average local church, the one-on-one -on -one disciple making, the disciple making type teaching is happening in your average church, Chris? Sadly enough, no. What would you recommend to someone in a local church to do? Someone sitting there in a local church, what would you recommend they do to make disciples and get people into a teaching environment? That's a good question, Pastor. Okay, so while you're thinking about it, I, I think I told this story, and I want to tell it again because we're resurfacing these things, is I had to change my calendar. Yeah. I had to change my focus from programs to people. And as a pastor, uh, I was pastor at a very uh, prestigious church in Lincoln County. And, uh, and I had to go, okay, if I'm going to reach newer, younger believers, I cannot spend all my time with the, with the more seasoned saints. Yeah. There was no way I was going to be able to do that and stay healthy. Right. So intentional would be you got to make appointments. Yes. Yeah, you know, I say I, I, I love evangelizing, but I, I've got five students that the Lord has sent my way right now, one of them long distance by phone, 
she's so hungry for God. Right. And, I, and I've seen, I like the other, the other thing we point out in the teaching that God works on your internals first and then externally, you know, it becomes visible. And that's what I'm seeing right now with her. I was sharing some of her texts this morning, just even in her verbiage. Right. You wouldn't have heard her use those words, you know, six months ago. Um, but yeah, we have to be, it's got to be relational. Sometimes in some of these teachings that we have in the morning, we'll, we only crack the Bible for, you know, the last 20 or 30 minutes um, because it's spending time with them. And you taught me this, listening. And it's what Just Jesus listen. did. Yeah. Sometimes we have to listen long enough to hear someone's story. Uh, before I really start discipling anybody, I ask them, who are you? And I do that by... If I'm in a group, I go state your name, but I know their name already. Tell me your life story as much as you want to tell, and where are you on your journey with God? If so, if we ask that, people will start sharing, and you'll get a view of where they are spiritually. It's not the whole view, but what happens in churches? We get people into programs. We're trying to get them to the teaching, and we need to do that. Yeah. What What's presupposed here is that Jesus spent three years with the 12 and others, but he, he related to them first. So it's intentional, but it's also relational disciple making, not program disciple making. And right. I'm not against all programs. I'm not trying to say that. But I, what I am saying is in the Western mindset is we're so enamored with numbers across the board. There's no we, impartation. There's no impartation. There's no giving away. That It's kind of like you give information away, but it's not relationally connected because the let's say the room has 50 people in it let's let's keep it real low 50 people that's a great number of people some people say well that's not a lot others could say that's a lot but the reality is once you get over 12 to 14 to 20 people you don't know if they've gotten it or not that's right. why I believe Jesus shows 12 and they that, were a handful enough and that's why it's not reproducible right so let's talk about reproducible so when we think of reproducing in, in the Western church, we're good at going, you know, we're good. We like to say disciple making, but there's been a real revival of this uh, among younger pastors, especially who've said, you know what? We don't want to just send people to a Sunday school class. We want to teach that Sunday school class to, to actually one-on-one, -on -one, one -on three disciple people. That, there is an outbreak of that with Robbie Gallaty and disciple make, uh, Making Disciples podcast is a great podcast. Uh, there's a lot going on with that. You and I are kind of Burtonites from John Burton. <laughs> we ran into John because he worked with Bill Bright. But what we expect is something to be given away. Pastor, this is uh, reproducible. I'm thinking of four of these five students, and uh, I can remember a, a a moment with each of these four separately and they're talking to someone else whether it be on the phone or one's reporting back to me about someone they just led to the Lord and I'm, I'm listening to some of the words this one that's on the phone talking to her, her one of her best friends and I, I'm, I'm in the living room on my knees praying and listening to this conversation I'm like she's just spitting everything back verbatim reproducible because of the intentional relationship that we've had in this discipleship, this time of discipleship. And now she and he and this other uh, person are reproducing it. They're giving it away. And what is the great book besides the Bible that we use that we can turn our viewers Robert on? Robert Coleman's? So. Robert Coleman's <laughs> Master <laughs> Plan of Evangelism. Master, that's right. You should buy that book. It's a small little book of about 75 pages. It's not contemporary stories. It's basically Robert Coleman outlining how Jesus spent time with the 12. Yes. And we, th this is why this is important for revival. Because I think a lot of churches, we want revival. Christians, we want revival. We're not ready for it. <laughs> so I think God sits back and says, why would I bring you a harvest when you're doing nothing with the, what I brought you already. And for us, we need to be able to change our mindset and our platform delivery for, for ministry and disciple making to where it's more intentional, relational, and then reproducible. We need to expect disciples to give away what we give them. So like when I work yeah. people through the circles, I start working them through. And if you're viewing and you're wondering, what are you talking about the circles? We said to, I said this about six weeks ago on the program. You can go to my website, alanstoddard.com, A-L-A-N-S-T-O-D-D-A-R-D.com. 
and it's right there when you come when you boot up the circles content is right there and we basically have a way to spend four four to six months with the person one-on-one -on -one where we give simple very simple crusade follow-up type content to where a person can get it and they also can immediately give it away it's like immediately and, and it's life applicable applicable uh, yes i i I use it every because I get to teach it so much. I get to apply it in my life every day. And the one thing I wanted to say about the harvest and revival, it, it's never stopped. He is risen. He's alive. He lives. I think that it's proportionate to those that are willing. We experience revival all the time the, and what, harvest we were, all the we time. We were talking about this is that we're, what we're seeing at Calvary Chapel Ruidoso is so many of us are getting in uh, unity around the Great Commission. And all the different gifting uh, parts of that are coming together. And when you get enough people have a heart for the Great Commission to reach out and to not think only in, when you start reaching out, it becomes contagious. <laughs> Next thing you know, people that were not really hot on evangelism, we're seeing that right they're now. stoked up, fired hot. And... And the next thing you know, people are getting saved. Uh, Pastor John was talking about it yesterday in his message. You know, people are getting saved in the hallways. People are getting saved in the living rooms. And it's because we're asking the Lord, let me say this right. It's not just us deciding. It's also God in us moving us to say, we want to be a part of something that's reproducible. And even if I made reproducible down to its lowest denominator, at some point, the, we are not to just sit and hear the word and it does nothing. We are to give back. So we started talking about ministry-based evangelism. Works. We were just talking about that. Ministry-based evangelism is where you throw like a block party or we did a back-to-school bash last week in our little parking lot. We're not a big church. You know, we run a couple hundred people, but our facility is just a regular small facility and we do two or three services. And we're not the biggest, baddest church around. I mean... We we just decided to get a bounce house, and um, Karen Roach was big on that. And we got a barbecue big, out. Big old we barbecue. got 150 to 200 backpacks, and we decided to give them away. Next thing you know, ministry-based. Three women event. doing haircuts. We had women doing haircuts. haircuts. And, 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 and then it gives us an opportunity to create this atmosphere where unchurched people are coming, and uh, they're not just getting stuff they're also getting the gospel because we're sharing the gospel with them we're inviting them to church which is pre-evangelism but it's a step pastor i got to lead two people to the lord in the parking lot that's that so day. awesome it was, yeah, that's it was. so awesome yeah and then okay then your heart goes out and says what are we going to do with those people i would challenge us you know that's the grunt work we don't always get to do the follow-up someone else does the follow-up we don't always know how that's going to work I, w I thought about th some things as I was praying that I would encourage our viewers. Because maybe you're sitting there and you're going, I love this topic. I, my heart is in it. I want to follow up with people. I want to be on mission with God. Every day of our lives is a mission trip. It, it, it's a wonderful opportunity to join God in what he's doing. But how do we do that? Um, if you're viewing and you're wondering, how do you make that happen? I'll give you a couple things. So if you're a pastor, leader, or teacher, or just the, you're motivated to do something for God, go to your church and say, can I have a list of the last 10 people who were baptized at our church? Mm. And just go invite them for a cup of coffee. Ask them how they're doing. Nothing freaky. Just ask them how they're doing. Or develop a list on your own of people that you have not seen in church in six months. Get 10 names and follow up on them. Start to pray for them before you go. Out of those 10, 10 20 list of people, God will give you a harvest inside those 20 people. Amen. If Wait, you follow, go ahead. I was, I was going to say that um, <clears throat> another thing is just take a breath, take a step back, who has the Lord drawn to you? Right. You know, that, that's how a lot of these students have come about, these disciples. It's people that the Lord places the members of the body as he sees fit. How about this as a part of the intentional part is that it's invest in people. In church life, we're so Find busy the getting them in and out. Find and, the need. and that happens. It's the nature of what we do. We gather and we want to do things well. That's what we do. 
But when we zero it in and we say, you know what, I'm not, I'm going to get intentional. How do you get intentional? You target people. You target them for love. You target them for an investment. You take them for a lunch or a coffee or you invite them over for just a discussion. Then it leads into if, if you're able to reproduce what God has done in you in any way, give that away. Because here's what, what will happen is it will create this atmosphere of disciple making. Of people will get excited. Now, here's the, down, the downside. Um, and we don't have a lot of time to explore this, but there will be people in churches when you start doing one-on-one, -on -one, one -on three the older seasoned saints who've been there for a while, uh, it doesn't have to be older, just the seasoned people or, the, or maybe religious people, they won't all, not all of them, most of them will be fine. There'll be a few that'll go, you're not spending enough time with me. Well, you just got to blow by that. The big brother it, and the prodigal. <laughs> yeah, you're the big brother and the prodigal story, and there's nothing you can do about that. But we want to encourage you viewers to consider your role in the Great Commission of Christ, to consider that, that God has a plan for you. He wants you, to be a, he wants you to be a part of stoking up, as I would say. <laughs> Stoke up the gift in you, Paul told Timothy. Fan to flame. fan the flame of, of, a, of the Great Commission, of the Word of God, of the teaching. Um, notice what happens, the progression. The main verb is make disciples. Well, how do you do that? Well, it's presupposed you're already going. Uh, and then he says baptizing. So when people get baptized, that's, that's the outward picture of inward faith. But right after that, that's like a delivery room. A baby has been born. What does the baby need initially? <laughs> All that we have just said. First Peter you can't 2, let them fall out. You can't, yeah, you can't let them fall out. We can't let people go undiscipled and we can't throw them into classes where the content of the Bible is over their head. Yeah. So again, we're all about keeping it simple. We want to encourage you to make disciples in your church. If there's any questions you have, reach out to us here at Life Christian TV. You can reach me through my website. Look me up on Facebook. Chris, we'll, we'll do anything we possibly can to help anyone uh, do these trainings. I would come to any church, no money involved. We would love to help you accomplish God's mission for you in your personal life and also in your church. Now listen, if you have never trusted Christ as your Savior, the Bible says Christ died for our sins, He was buried, and He rose again on the third day. He died for your sins and mine. We can receive him as our savior through repentance and faith in Christ. Trust Jesus as your savior. God bless you. We'll see you next time.